Welcome to this review of the restarts from the Soccer's Laws of the Game. The goal of this topic is to go over in detail the eight ways of restarting the game when the ball goes out of play. As soccer is a game of nearly continuous flow, understanding the detailed nuances of when a particular restart must be used and the rules regarding that particular restart must be well understood by the referee. Too often, referees fail to understand these rules and either allow attacking opportunities and goals that shouldn't have been allowed or halt opportunities or deny goals that should have been allowed. I hope you develop a better understanding of these rules in this review. So, exactly what is a restart? A restart is the means by which the ball is put back into play after the ball has gone out of play. And before we go discussing what those restarts are, we had better clearly define and review exactly when the ball is in play and when it is out of play. So when is the ball out of play? In two situations, when the whole of the ball passes completely over one of the boundary lines, the goal line or the touch line, or when the referee stops play, for example, an infringement, outside interference, or the end of a half. At all other times, the ball is considered to be in play. Understanding now definitively when the ball is in play and when it is not, how can we restart the game when the ball has gone out of play? There are eight restarts in the sport of soccer, and their importance is so great that every law except Law 10 has some sort of reference to one of them. The eight restarts are the kickoff, the dropped ball, the throw-in, the corner kick, the goal kick, the direct free kick, the indirect free kick, and the penalty kick. What we need to know about each of these restarts can be broken down into simple questions. During this presentation, we're going to answer these questions on each of the eight restarts and likely branch off into special rules for the individual restarts as needed. However, if you can come out of this presentation knowing how to answer each of the following questions for each restart, you'll be in great shape. First, when is the restart used? Second, what are the requirements for the restart to be taken correctly? Third, what violations can occur during the restart and how must they be dealt with? Fourth, must the restart be ceremonial? That is, does it require the referee's permission to proceed? Fifth, can a team score a goal directly from the restart on the opposing team? Sixth, can a team score a goal on itself directly from the restart? And lastly, can a player be called offside if they receive the ball directly from the restart? For some of these restarts, these questions may seem a bit silly, but this is a great way to break down the restarts and structure this presentation on a quote, what you need to know basis. Let's get started. When is a kickoff used to restart the match? There are four situations. They are starting the match, starting the second half, starting a period of extra time, and after a goal. Players must be properly positioned when a kickoff is used. There are limitations on where they are permitted on the field. The kicking team's players must all be in their own half of the field behind the halfway line. They may not cross the halfway line until the ball has been put into play. One player from the kicking team is permitted to stand in the opposing side of the field. That player must be the one taking the kickoff. The defending team's players not only must be in their own half of the field, but must also be outside the center circle. Defending players may not enter the center circle or cross the halfway line until the ball is put into play. The site of the kickoff is always on the center mark, a spot in the direct center of the center circle. In order for the kickoff to take place, the referee must blow his or her whistle to permit the kick to be taken. Verbal comments are not considered acceptable. The kickoff is in play when the ball is kicked and moves. A kickoff can move forwards or backwards. Let's review possible violations that can occur at the taking of a kickoff. If a player crosses into the opponent's half of the field before the kick is taken, in this case the rules for the taking of the kickoff have been violated prior to the ball being put into play, and the kickoff cannot be allowed to proceed. Reset the players to the proper position, then retake the kickoff. If a defender enters the center circle prior to the kick being taken, this violation is similar to a player from either team crossing the halfway line prior to the kick. The players are once again not in the correct position prior to the taking of the kickoff, therefore the kickoff should not proceed. They should be reset to their proper position and the kickoff again retaken. 
At the taking of a kickoff, what happens if the player taking the kick touches the ball again before any other player touches it? In this situation, the players are all properly positioned and the ball is kicked. Therefore, the ball has been put into play properly. This infraction occurs after the kickoff and a double touch by the kicking player results in an indirect free kick to the opposing team where the ball was touched the second time. Can you score a goal from a kickoff? Absolutely. It's been done several times at the professional and college level and is seen here even caught on video once or twice. Can a team score on itself directly from a kickoff? The traditions of the game and generally accepted principle, however, is that a team cannot score on itself from any restart it has been awarded, so the answer is no. Can you be called for offside, receiving the ball directly from a kickoff? The answer to this question is no, but that's because you can't be in offside position when a kickoff is taken. Remember, all of the players have to be in their own half of the field and with the ball on the center mark. Attackers cannot be in offside position on their own half of the field, and they cannot be offside when they are behind the ball. With the defenders in their own half of the field, it's impossible to be closer to the attacking goal line than the second to last defender. Let's move on to the next restart, which, like the kickoff, is covered in Law 8, the dropped ball. When is a dropped ball used? The drop ball is used whenever no other defined restart can be used to restart play, but is also used in specific defined situations that were incorporated into the laws in 2020. The drop ball remains a catch-all when no other rules apply. Nonetheless, it's important to know when the other seven restarts should be used because drop balls can be messy and generally speaking aren't popular with players or coaches. Don't get me wrong. If a game has to be restarted with a drop ball, participants understand this, but if there's one way to get under the skin of the players and coaches, it's using a drop ball when a different restart is called for. Stopping play to assess an injury and outside interference are some of the more common reasons we use the drop ball to restart a match. For example, a dog or fan rushing the field when the ball is in play would require the referee to halt play to prevent problems, and a dropped ball would then be used to restart the game. We also use drop balls for weather stoppages and if we stop play for game equipment failures like a broken goal or the ball going flat. In 2020, IFAB incorporated several new situations that call for a dropped ball. These situations pertain to contact of the ball with the referee. They include if the ball touches the referee and either team is able to start an attack from that contact, if the ball comes off the referee and then directly enters either goal, and if the team in possession of the ball changes as a result of contact with the referee. Say the ball comes off the referee as the defensive team is playing the ball out of its back, but then rebounds to another defender. No attack has been started, the ball does not enter the goal, possession does not change. This is an example of a situation where the ball could touch a member of the officiating crew and play would not have to be stopped and restarted with a dropped ball. In most situations, however, the contact with the match official will impact the play significantly, so it's always a safe bet to simply stop play and conduct a drop ball when the ball contacts one of the officials. It's important to keep in mind that the drop ball is used only when the referee has halted play. If the ball is out of play due to a foul or having gone over the boundary line, remember that these situations have specific restarts assigned to them. Unfortunately, some referees forget this. For example, if the ball has gone out of play for a throw-in and then play is suspended for lightning, some referees may suddenly tweak their brain and think, weather stoppage, that's a drop ball, when in fact, the ball was already out of play. When the weather delay ends, play would still be restarted with a throw-in. A common misconception also exists that if a drop ball can be used instead of a throw-in if the referee is unsure who touched the ball last when the ball goes over a touch line. Please do not make this mistake. Only one restart can occur when the ball leaves the field over a touch line, and the drop ball is not it. Where is the ball dropped when a drop ball is used? In most cases, the ball should be dropped at its location when play was halted. The ball is dropped for one player of the team that last touched the ball. However, if play is halted with the ball inside one of the penalty areas, or if the ball was last touched inside one of the penalty areas and play is stopped before it is touched again, the ball is dropped inside the penalty area where it was last touched for the goalkeeper who defends that penalty area. What is the positioning of the players for a dropped ball? 
effective for 2020, every drop ball is now dropped for one and only one player. If outside the penalty areas, the ball is dropped for one player for the team that last touched the ball. All other players must be a minimum of four meters from the player receiving the drop ball. If inside either penalty area, the ball is dropped for the goalkeeper who is permitted to use his or her hands in that penalty area and all other players must be at least four meters away. The referee should drop the ball from waist height. We don't throw the ball down, simply pull your hand away and let it go. The ball is in play the moment it hits the ground. Once the ball strikes the ground, the player for whom the ball is being dropped may now play the ball directly. This includes playing the ball to another player, dribbling, or, if a goalkeeper in his or her own penalty area, picking the ball up with the hands immediately. The referee may drop the ball at any moment, no warning or whistle is required, so the drop ball is the only restart that is never ceremonial. What violations can occur at a dropped ball? The most common violation used to be the ball being touched before it hit the ground. If that happened, the ball would have never entered play, so the ball should be redropped. With the new protocol, where the ball is dropped for only one player, this really should no longer happen. If the field you're using has an odd slope, it may be possible for the ball to be dropped and then roll over a boundary line before being touched. If this happens, the ball should be redropped. What if a player plays the ball twice consecutively after the ball hits the ground? This is permitted. Double touches do not occur on dropped balls. A player may take possession of a drop ball and then dribble the ball away. Can a player score a goal directly from a drop ball? The answer is no. In order to score from a drop ball, the ball must touch a second different player than the one who touches the ball first before entering either goal. What about being offside when receiving the ball directly from a drop ball? A player may take a drop ball from an offside position that is closer to the opponent's goal line than both the ball and the second to last defender. However, once the ball hits the ground and is live, if that offside player receives the ball from a teammate, then the player should be punished for offside. The next restart we will cover is the throw-in, which is covered by Law 15 in the Laws of the Game. When is a throw-in used as a restart? The throw-in is used when the ball leaves the field going over one of the touch lines. A throw-in is granted to the team opposing the player who last touched the ball. Importantly, the ball has always touched one player or another last. No matter what you may have seen or heard, under IFAB's laws, any time the ball leaves the field over a touch line to go out of play, the game must be restarted with a throw-in. Decide which team gets the throw-in, then move on. Remember what we said earlier about using a dropped ball when you aren't sure who touched it last and that only one restart can result when the ball leaves the field over a touchline? That restart is a throw-in. You have to decide which team is awarded the throw-in. There are six requirements for a legally taken throw-in. The ball must be thrown in with both hands on the ball. The ball must start from behind and come over the top of the head. The player must face the field. Both of the throwing player's feet must be on or behind the touch line on the ground and the player must be standing. The thrower must take the throw from where the ball left the field. About one yard of leeway is generally allowed unofficially. And opposing players must yield two yards from the thrower to allow the thrower to put the ball back into play. A special mention should be made here of the flip throw, where a player will do a cartwheel, land on their feet, and using the generated momentum throw the ball a great distance. The flip throw is legal if it meets all of the requirements for a legal throw. If the ball comes from behind the head, with both hands on the ball, both feet are on the ground and on or behind the touch line when the throw is made, it doesn't matter what the thrower does in their run up or in this case, the flip up. The ball may be thrown in as soon as the thrower wants to take the throw in. A throw in does not normally require the referee's permission to be taken. However, if the referee has other duties to attend to while the ball is out of play, for instance, a substitution, administration of misconduct, or management of an injury, in these circumstances, a referee whistle is required to allow the thrower to restart play. The ball returns to play off a throw-in when the ball breaks the plane of the touchline and is released from the thrower's hands. Possible violations that can occur on a throw-in are numerous. Technique violations by the thrower result in the awarding of the throw-in to the opposing team. These can include the thrower using just one hand, 
not bringing the ball from behind the head, having one or both feet entirely over the touchline and in the field of play, or raising a foot off the ground before releasing the ball. In particular, attention should be paid to the start and the release point of the throwing motion. Dropping the ball a short distance or spiking the ball to the ground with force must be done using the proper technique, starting from behind the head and bringing the ball over the top of the head in a fluid continuous motion. Also, we need to emphasize the player must have both feet on the ground. Therefore, a throw in taken from the knees would be considered illegal. Each of these infractions, again, would result in the awarding of a throw-in to the opposition at the same location. What if the ball leaves the thrower's hands and never breaks the plane of the touchline? What if the ball hits the ground before entering the field of play? In these cases, the ball has not been properly put back into play and the throw-in should be retaken by the same team at the original location. If the ball is thrown in and then touched again by the thrower without another player touching it, this is a double touch infraction and an indirect free kick would be awarded to the opposing team. If a player attempts to take a throw in from a spot on the field that is not within one yard of where the ball left the field, the referee crew should attempt to correct the mistake before the throw is taken. Use a whistle to hold up play, then correct the position. This usually happens when the thrower is in a hurry to get the ball back into play, but sometimes it's used to gain a positional advantage and this needs to be enforced. The idea here is not, however, to play gotcha, but rather correct the position of the throw and then allow the restart to occur normally. Nonetheless, if there is a gross violation or a violation is recognized after the ball is put back into play, play should be stopped and a throw-in granted to the opposing team at the spot of the original throw-in. If a defender fails to yield two yards, again, try to intervene before the throw and correct the defender's position. This is a cautionable offense, failing to respect the required distance. But the idea is, is to intervene before having to pull a card from the pocket. Generally, cautions are only administered when the defender actively interferes with the taking of the throw-in. There is a gross and blatant violation, however. Play should be stopped and the guilty defender cautioned. Play would then be restarted with the original throw-in. A defender may also attempt to distract or confuse the thrower from outside the two-yard radius. This would still be cautionable behavior for unsporting behavior instead of failure to respect the required distance. You cannot score a goal directly from a throw-in, either against the opposing team or against your own team. Should the ball enter the opposing team's goal without touching another player, the correct restart would be a goal kick. Should the ball enter the player's own team's goal directly from a throw-in, the correct restart would be a corner kick. A throw-in is one of the three exceptions to the offside rule where a player can receive the ball last touched by a teammate when that player was standing in an offside position and not be punished for offside. Now we move on to the goal kick, which is covered by Law 16. The goal kick is used when three requirements are met. The ball leaves the field over a goal line, last touched by a member of the attacking team, and a goal is not awarded. Obviously, this applies any time the ball crosses the goal line and does not go into the goal, but would also apply in situations where the ball might end up in the goal, but a goal cannot be awarded. The goal kick is awarded to the team defending that end of the field. The goal kick can be taken from anywhere within the goal area or the lines marking the goal area. There are some effects of position requirements for some of the players at the taking of a goal kick. Attacking players may be inside the penalty area when the kick is taken. If they are inside the penalty area, they are not permitted to interfere with the ball or a defending player who is playing the ball directly from the goal kick. Defenders can stand anywhere during a goal kick. They have no restrictions. The ball must be within the goal area. Similar to a throw-in, there's no requirement for players to wait to take a goal kick unless the referee has to hold up play for substitution, misconduct, or injury. The kick may otherwise be taken at any time. If play is held up, a whistle is required to restart. A goal kick re-enters play when it is kicked and moves. In 2020, IFAB changed the laws such that the ball no longer needs to leave the penalty area from a goal kick to be in play. Attackers may challenge for the ball once a goal kick is kicked and moves, but only if those attackers have first left the penalty area. 
if an attacker who has not left the penalty area attempts to challenge for a ball still inside the penalty area after a goal kick is taken, play should be halted and the goal kick is retaken. A goal kick cannot be touched again by the kicking player until a second player from either team touches the ball. This violation would be a double touch and would result in an indirect free kick for the opposing team at the location where the double touch occurred. Infractions on goal kicks are rare but possible. If an attacker who is inside the penalty area when the goal kick was taken challenges for the ball before it leaves the penalty area, stop play and retake the goal kick. If the ball is placed outside the goal area or is moving when the kick is taken, the referee may request the goal kick be retaken if, in his opinion, the infraction is not trivial. If the kicker plays the ball a second time before another player touches the ball, this is a double touch and would result in an indirect free kick to the opposing team. Can you score a goal directly against the opposing team off a goal kick? While difficult, it is in fact permissible. However, a team may not score a goal against itself no matter what the circumstance. Here's an example of a team being apparently victimized by a windy day having their goal kick get blown back into their own goal. As Law 16 clearly states a team may not score directly on themselves, the proper restart from this strange incident should be a corner kick. A goal kick is defined as one of the three restarts from which an offside player may receive a ball directly and not be penalized for offside. The next restart is the corner kick, defined by Law 17. The corner kick is used when three requirements are met, similar to the goal kick with one twist. The ball leaves the field over a goal line, last touched by a member of the defending team, and a goal is not awarded. As with the goal kick, a ball that winds up in the goal, but in a situation where a goal cannot be awarded, for example, entering the goal directly from a throw-in by a defender, or the wind-blown goal kick seen in that last slide, should result in a corner kick being granted. The corner kick is awarded to the team attacking that end of the field. The corner kick must be taken from the corner arc nearest where the ball left play. If the ball leaves the field directly in the center of the goal line, the arc to be used is at the discretion of the referee. The ball position on a corner kick is going to be consistent with our general consideration of the lines on the field, that is, if any part of the ball breaks the vertical plane of the line it is over, it is considered to be within the boundaries of that area that the line is encompassing. For a corner kick, then, if any part of the diameter of the ball sits over the corner arc, it is considered to be properly positioned. The only requirement for player positioning at the taking of a corner kick is that the defending team must yield 10 yards from the corner arc line. Traditionally, the required distance is from the ball, but Law 17 explicitly says this distance is measured from the arc line for the corner kick. Aside from this, there are no restrictions for any players at the taking of a corner kick. As with the throw-in and goal kick, there is no requirement for players to wait to take a corner kick unless the referee has to hold up play for a substitution, misconduct, or injury. Again, if the restart is held up by the referee, a whistle is required to permit the corner kick to proceed. A corner kick re-enters play once it is kicked and moves. The corner kick does not have to leave the corner arc and can even move away from the field. Late in close matches, many teams will play a short corner and then hold possession in the corner to kill time. Some teams will also use this rule to try to catch defenders unaware, kicking but barely moving a ball to lull the defense to sleep when a second player swoops in and then dribbles the ball out of the corner. As with most other restarts, a corner kick cannot be played a second time by the kick taker until another player has touched the ball. Violations at the taking of a corner kick can include encroachment by the defending team. As with encroachment elsewhere on the field, trivial infractions can be disregarded, but attention should be paid to attempts to interfere from within the required distance, and preventative measures should be taken to discourage further infringements that might not be so trivial. Encroachment that is not trivial would result in a retake of the corner kick and a caution to the defending player for failing to respect the required distance. While most corner kicks are taken routinely, the short corner, where a ball is played to a teammate standing next to the kick taker, must be watched to confirm that the ball has been kicked and moves. Simply stepping on the ball is not considered putting the ball into play. The referee should witness the ball being struck by the foot and moving discernibly in one direction or another, rather than simply being depressed into the turf. If the ball is not actually kicked or movement is not witnessed, the referee should pay attention to the second player attempting to dribble away, which could be considered a double touch. 
If the kicker plays the ball a second time before another player touches the ball, such as an inappropriately taken short corner, this is a double touch infraction and should result in an indirect free kick to the opposing team. Lastly, corner kicks lend themselves to a lot of physical, we'll call it positioning, for lack of a better term, both before and after the ball has been put into play. The referee needs to be alert for attempts by attackers to interfere with the movement of the goalkeeper or by players from either team grabbing jerseys or obstructing movement without any intent of playing the ball. A goal against the opposing team may be scored directly from a corner kick in soccer slang known as an Olympico. As illustrated here by U.S. women's national team legend Megan Rapino, it takes a tremendous amount of technical skill and maybe a little bit of luck to do so. A goal may not be scored against the kicker's own team. Apologies to viewers, but alas, I don't have any insane video of this happening. If it ever does happen in one of your games, I'd love to hear or see about it. The corner kick is the third and final restart from which a player can receive a ball directly in an offside position and not be punished. The odds of this happening are highly unlikely with the ball so close to the goal line, but if it does, the attacking player cannot be punished for offside. However, corner kicks and the offside rule deserve a bit more consideration. It's absolutely essential the taking of a corner kick to account for the attacking team's tactics and the positioning of all players on the field. The offside line and decision shifts quickly and dramatically on corner kicks. On the long corner, the AR must be alert for the second touch. One common attacking tactic is to flick the ball across the mouth of the goal. The first attacker's touch is designed to draw the attention of the defense so that a second attacker on the opposite side can sneak in and score. However, once that touch occurs by the first attacker, the offside rule is now in effect, and the AR must be alert for the possibility that the second player may be offside when the ball is touched by his or her teammate. On the short corner, while the first touch after the corner cannot be called for offside, again, the second touch can be. Most teams will avert this by running an overlap, bringing the kicker behind the ball so that if he receives the pass, he will be behind the ball and cannot be punished for offside. Occasionally, the kicker will forget this and remain closer to the goal line than the ball, so the offside call may come into play. If this does happen, the AR must then recognize the position of other defenders not involved in the challenge on the ball. For example, defending players standing on the post and or the goalkeeper may keep the attacker in an onside position. Most defenses will pull up on the short corner to create an offside trap of sorts, so the AR must be acutely aware of the tactics of both sides on these complicated plays. Now let's move on to the last three restarts, all of which only occur when the referee stops play, as opposed to a ball crossing a boundary line. We'll start with the direct free kick, which is covered in Law 13. A direct free kick is awarded when either a player commits one of the 11 direct free kick fouls, when a substitute or team official interferes with play on the field. In either case, the ball must be in play at the time of the infraction. The direct free kick is taken from the spot where the foul occurred, or more specifically, where the victim of the foul was, with one exception that we'll cover in short order. To give some clarification to this statement, say the ball is in play at this end of the field, but a defender strikes an opponent at this end. The site of the free kick would be where the victim of the foul was, so the free kick would move to here. Alternatively, if a goalkeeper threw the ball violently at an opponent standing outside the penalty area, the victim of this striking offense would be here, and the direct free kick would be taken from that location. Requirements for the taking of a direct free kick are numerous, and in of itself could be its own presentation. To summarize briefly, the ball must be stationary before being put into play. Trivial infractions of this can be ignored, but a team taking a quick free kick must settle the ball before playing it. Defenders must yield 10 yards from the spot of the kick. Note this is not a requirement that is only enforced when requested by the kicking team. The defense must give 10, and the attacking team does not have to request it. If a direct free kick is taken from within the kicking team's penalty area, in addition to yielding 10 yards, the attacking players must be outside the penalty area or cannot interfere with the ball until they first leave the penalty area. The direct free kick can be taken when the kicking team wants to take it. No whistle is required for a free kick unless, as with the throw-in, corner kick, and goal kick, administrative duties such as injury management or substitutions or administering a card require the referee to hold up the kick. In addition to these duties, the referee may choose to make a free kick ceremonial on their own, holding up the kick to manage player positioning or the match in general. If this is done, again, a whistle would be required to allow the free kick to progress. 
If a defensive team chooses to form a wall of at least three players at a free kick, the attacking team is not permitted to have any of its players within one yards of that wall. If the referee notes an attacking player trying to stand closer than this, the referee should warn the attacker that he or she is about to commit a violation, which will result in a free kick being awarded to the defending team. This warning should be issued prior to the taking of the free kick and should result in the free kick becoming ceremonial. The ball is in play from a direct free kick when it is kicked and moves in any direction. As with the goal kick change in 2020, the ball does not have to leave a penalty area from a defensive free kick to be in play. The rules that define kicked and moves for a direct free kick are identical to that of a corner kick. Stepping on the ball is not considered putting it into play. It must move a discernible amount. Violations that can occur on a direct free kick include actions by both teams. If a defender encroaches within 10 yards, as with defender encroachment on other restarts, some infractions may be trivial and verbal warnings could be sufficient. If the encroachment clearly interferes with the taking of a direct free kick, the referee may caution for failure to respect the required distance. Blatant attempts to interfere with the taking of a free kick must be dealt with, as failure to do so can impact game control. A defender that stands like a statue in front of the ball, or kicks the ball away, or denies the attacking team the ball, refusing to give it to them, must be dealt with by the referee and can be cautioned for delaying the restart of play. However, if an attacker takes a direct free kick quickly and then plays the ball directly to an idle defender who has not had time to retreat, this is not interference, and the attacker must accept the risk for taking the kick quickly in the subsequent loss of possession. If a teammate of the kicker stands within one yard of a formed wall of three players or more and is still doing so when the free kick is taken, play should be stopped immediately and an indirect free kick is awarded to the defensive team. If the kick is ceremonial requiring a whistle and an attacker takes the kick before the whistle, the ball should be replaced and the kick is retaken. If an attacker continues to commit this infraction, a caution can be given for delaying the restart of play. If the player taking the direct free kick plays the ball a second time before any other player touches it, this is a double touch, and an indirect free kick should be awarded to the opposing team. The kicking team can score directly from a direct free kick, hence the name direct free kick. However, a team may not score on itself directly from a direct free kick. Again, this would be a situation that would result in a corner kick with the ball crossing the goal line, last touched by a defender, and a goal cannot be awarded. A player can be called for offside if they receive the ball directly from a direct free kick in an offside position. Law 13 also covers indirect free kicks, the seventh of the game's eight restarts. An indirect free kick is awarded when a player, substitute, substituted player, or team official commits one of the eight indirect free kick infractions defined in Law 12. Not all indirect free kick infractions must occur on the field, and none of them involve contact with an opposing player or individual. Additionally, other infringements on the laws can result in an indirect free kick, such as the double touch we've been referring to throughout this presentation and offside. The indirect free kick is awarded to the team opposing the player who committed the infraction. The location of the indirect free kick is dependent on many things, including the type of infringement, the individual who committed the infraction, and where that individual was. We'll try to explain this by giving some examples in the next slide. If an indirect free kick offense is committed on the field by a player when the ball is in play, the site of the indirect free kick will be at the site of the infraction. There are numerous possible exceptions. In this first example, a substitute comes off the bench and enters the field. Play is stopped without the substitute interfering. The indirect free kick would be granted where the ball was when play was stopped to deal with the substitute who is guilty of entering the field without permission. If a player's momentum carries the player off the field and then that player commits an indirect free kick offense, the restart would be on the boundary line closest to where the infraction occurred. Obviously, an indirect free kick cannot be given off the field. On top of that, indirect free kicks cannot be taken inside of the attacking goal area. Any time an attacking indirect free kick would normally be granted inside of a goal area, the ball should be moved parallel to that spot on the six yard line. Lastly, if the defending team is given an indirect free kick inside its own goal area, the kicking team may place the ball anywhere within the goal area like a goal kick. The kick need not be taken from the spot of the infraction. Requirements for the taking of an indirect free kick are similar to those of a direct free kick with a few quirks. 
As with a direct free kick, the ball must be stationary before being put into play, and defenders must yield 10 yards from the spot of the kick. However, because an indirect free kick could be awarded within 10 yards of an opponent's goal, in this unique situation, the defending team is permitted to have players within the 10-yard radius as long as they are on the goal line and between the goal posts. As with direct free kicks, if the defending team forms a three-person wall or larger, all attacking team players may not stand closer than one yard to this wall. As with the direct free kick, the kicking team only needs to wait for a whistle if there are administrative duties such as injury management or substitution or misconduct, or if the referee chooses to make the kick ceremonial for game or player management purposes. The ball is in play under the same circumstances as a direct free kick when it is kicked and moves. I will not repeat the violations that can occur for a direct free kick again for the indirect free kick. Those violations can all occur at the taking of an indirect free kick as well from an attacker taking a ceremonial kick before the whistle to the double touch infraction. However, the indirect free kick does provide one unique infraction due to the fact that, by its name, the ball cannot enter the goal directly and a goal be scored. An indirect free kick must touch another player before entering the goal. If the attacking team mistakenly plays the ball directly into the opponent's goal, no goal can be scored, and as the ball has crossed the goal line last touched by an attacking player, a goal kick should be awarded. Mind you, if the ball does touch any other player on its way to goal, this eliminates this concern and a goal would then count. This feature makes defensive encroachment on 10 yards a bit more dicey for indirect free kicks. In many indirect free kicks in the attacking third of the field, the attacking team will touch the ball short to a teammate to create the second touch and allow a shot to be taken. Defenders may anticipate this first touch and try to rush in to cut the angle. The referee needs to be aware of and manage the gamesmanship that can occur on both sides of the ball in this situation. As with a direct free kick, an indirect free kick may not be kicked directly into a player's own goal and a goal be scored. The restart would be a corner kick for the opposing team. Offside rules for the indirect free kick are the same as those for a direct free kick. If a player received the ball in an offside position directly from an indirect free kick, offside should be called. The final restart we have to cover is the penalty kick. The penalty kick is covered by Law 14 in the Laws of the Game. The penalty kick is awarded when a player commits one of the 11 direct free kick offenses within his or her own penalty area or when a substitute or team official interferes with play within his or her own penalty area. The penalty kick is awarded to the team victimized by the foul and the spot of the penalty kick is on the penalty mark in the penalty area where the foul occurred. We're going to change format a bit for the penalty kick. Being such an important moment in a match, we're going to walk through how to set up for a penalty, how a penalty kick is taken legally, what violations can occur between the permission to proceed and the taking of the kick, and finally what violations can occur after the taking of the kick. There are numerous specific requirements for the taking of a penalty kick. The ball must be on the penalty mark. The player taking the penalty kick must be clearly identified so that the opposing goalkeeper and the goal line assistant referee knows who is taking the kick and can fairly anticipate the ball being put into play. Player positioning is very important at the taking of a penalty kick. The goalkeeper must have at least one foot on the goal line and must face the kicker. All of the players, teammates, or opponents must yield 10 yards to the ball except the kicker. The penalty arc demarcates a 10-yard radius from the penalty spot, which means that players must be outside the arc. Players must also not be inside the penalty area and must be above the ball, meaning they cannot stand on the lateral sides of the penalty area closer to the goal line than 12 yards. The positioning of all players should be checked and double-checked prior to allowing a penalty kick to proceed. A penalty kick requires a referee's whistle to proceed. The ball is in play when it is kicked and it moves forward. There is a fairly impressive list of potential violations that can occur after the referee blows his whistle, but before the ball is played, and violations can be committed by both teams. We'll first cover all the potential violations, then talk about what to do about them. For the kicking team, violations may be committed by either the kicker or his teammates. The kicker is permitted to stutter step on the way to the ball and may vary the run-up direction as long as it is not excessive or distracting in the opinion of the referee. The referee may also determine that the kicker is making gestures designed to confuse the goalkeeper and may deem this behavior unsporting. Finally, once the kicker reaches the ball in his run-up, he must kick the ball. He cannot draw his leg back, hold it, nor may he run past the ball, then back up and kick it. 
The kicker's teammates are capable of committing several violations as well. These include entering the penalty area or arc before the ball is kicked, moving within 12 yards of the goal line before the ball is kicked, or running into the penalty area and taking the kick instead of the designated kicker doing so. For the defending team, violations before the ball is kicked may be committed by either the goalkeeper or his or her teammates. The goalkeeper must have one foot on the goal line until the ball is kicked. He or she cannot move backwards or forwards, but is permitted to move sideways prior to the kick. The goalkeeper's teammates can commit the same violations as the kicker's teammates, except kicking the ball, obviously. They can enter the penalty area or arc prior to the ball being kicked, move closer to the goal line than the penalty mark before the ball is kicked. Once the ball is played by the kicker, three additional violations become possible by the attacking team. First, the kicker may play the ball backwards. A penalty kick must be played forward. Second, the kicker could commit a double touch. For example, if the ball were to rebound from the frame of the goal back to the kicker, then the kicker touch it again before any other player. Finally, once the ball is in play, the referee must become acutely aware of the possibility of offside if the ball rebounds from the goal frame or the goalkeeper. Once the ball is touched by a second player, players may have moved into offside position and therefore offside decisions could come into play. Because the assistant referee is based on the goal line for this restart, responsibility of calling offside must lie with the referee once the ball enters play. Lastly, there's the possibility of outside interference with the penalty kick. If the ball goes flat or is interfered with before it reaches the goalkeeper or the goal, this is not a violation, but it would require the retaking of the penalty kick. That summarizes the multitude of potential violations at the taking of a penalty kick. The question is, what do we do about them? The column indicating what to do when the ball does not enter the goal means any outcome where the ball does not end up in the goal. A keeper save, the ball being shot over the crossbar or wide of the post, the ball being deflected over the crossbar, whatever. If an attacker commits a violation and a goal is not scored, you do not go with whatever restart would normally happen. You stop play and give an indirect free kick at the spot of the violation. One of the great myths of penalty kicks is that if there is a retake, the same player must take the kick. That's not true. Any player may take a retake. Please note that if a teammate of the designated kicker runs into the penalty area and takes the kick, regardless of the outcome, an indirect free kick is granted to the defending team where the teammate entered the penalty area or arc, and the player who wrongly took the penalty is cautioned for unsporting behavior. If the player kicks the ball backwards, play should be stopped immediately, and an indirect free kick granted to the defending team at the penalty mark, there is no caution for this infraction. A non-designated player taking the penalty kick, a fake kick where a player starts the kicking motion and halts it, and the ball being kicked backwards are the only violations where play is halted immediately. For all other violations committed by an attacker, defender, or by both teams, allow the kick to proceed and resolve the violation after noting the outcome. In situations where the goalkeeper comes off the goal line early and the ball does not enter the goal, the kicking team is granted a retake. The first time this happens in a match, the goalkeeper is given a verbal warning. If the goalkeeper commits the same offense later in the match, even on the retake, after having already been warned, the goalkeeper is cautioned for any subsequent offenses. A third such offense would result in a second caution and sending off. Lastly, you can also caution a player if that player repeatedly infringes on Law 14, necessitating numerous retakes. For example, if the same attacker keeps encroaching and the shooter keeps scoring, you could caution the encroaching attacker for persistent infringement. One other interesting feature of penalty kicks is that they are the only restart which must be allowed to take place even if all time has run out. If time runs out after a penalty kick has been called but before it is taken, the penalty kick must still be taken. The recommendation of this situation is to notify the players that this will be the final play of the period. Non-participating players must remain on the field of play, but by advising them that the kick will be the final play, it reduces the risk of infractions by the non-participating players. You cannot force players to move away from the penalty area, but if they are aware that a rebound can't be played, it eliminates the need to encroach into the penalty area or arc. Penalty kicks taken in extended time are considered complete when the momentum of the ball is spent. Understand that momentum is not spent if the ball rebounds off the goalkeeper or if the goalkeeper fumbles the ball towards the goal. Once the ball is kicked, the only player who may make contact with the ball is the goalkeeper. 
The ball can rebound from the frame, hit the goalkeeper, or take a wicked spin and still wind up in the goal. As seen here, some absolutely nutty bounces can take place, and you need to let the ball finish its momentum before declaring the result of the kick. Both of these, these examples are from kicks from the marked tiebreakers, but the rules for that and penalty kicks taken in extended time are the same. Unfortunately for the goalkeepers in these videos, they were apparently clueless to this rule. The remaining three restart questions that we have are relatively easy to answer for a penalty kick. Obviously, a goal can be scored directly. As the ball must move forward from a penalty kick, it's virtually impossible to score on your own team from the taking of a penalty kick, and for the sake of simplicity, it should be assumed that a team may not score directly on itself from a penalty kick. Because all players must be behind the ball when the kick is taken, players cannot be called for offside if receiving the ball from a penalty kick. Odd, I know, but it's possible for a kicker to pass the ball laterally and forward to a teammate, who then runs into the penalty area and then scores. Nonetheless, a second player cannot be offside due to the required position of the players prior to the whistle being blown. Thank you for watching this restart review. We hope it has been helpful for you.